So when Kevin asked what was our, you know, one of our most unforgettable Christmases, we have many, but one that I remember well is when Amber was about two and a half years old, she was our pacifier baby, and she would not give up her pacifier, would needed it to sleep, needed it to calm her down all the time. She called it her boppy, and she always wanted her boppy. So around Christmas time, Steve came up with a good idea to maybe, um, see if Amber would give her boppy, her pacifier, to Santa Claus. <laughs> and um, telling Amber that, you know, there are other kids that need pacifiers and, you know, they really don't have them. And this way you can help other kids. <laughs> so she brought her little pacifiers in a little bag and gave them to Santa Claus at two and a half to help, um, help other kids. So that worked and the cool part is now she's 18 and she's still one of the most giving, loving people. Um, and all started with her pacifier, her palpy story. And that was one of our most unforgettable Christmases. That's good stuff right there. Anytime you can embarrass your kids, it's a good day. Um, well, again, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Um, I uh, just have some, I think, some stuff that God's laid on my heart uh, this morning, and I, I, I've been praying over this um, for a few weeks. Um, I, I changed on Monday what I was going to share about, um, which is interesting because um, God laid on my heart to talk about um, plans. And uh, you're probably uh, like Steve and Tara, uh, in the pacifier, you've made some plans before and they worked out great. Congrat I mean, that's a genius plan on, on getting rid of pacifiers. Have Santa take care of it for you. Um, and, and if you're like them and you're like me, maybe you've made some great plans before. Um, I remember one of my most ingenious plans uh, whenever I was around 9 or 10. Um, we woke up on Christmas Day, my sister and I, and it was about 4 in the morning. I don't know if Shara remembers this, but... Um, I, I vividly remember it. We woke up at four. I probably woke her up. And we sat there and we're like, how can we, how can we open presents? It's four. So I came up with the plan, or maybe she did. One of us came up with the plan to change every clock in the house. <laughs> so this was before cell phones, so we didn't have to worry about that. We walked around the house and changed every clock in the house to say eight o'clock. So we went in and woke up mom and said, Mom, it's, it's Christmas, it's eight. So we get up and we open our presents and we eat breakfast. And by that point, the clocks say nine o'clock and it's still pitch dark outside. <laughs> and we admit, uh, we changed the clock. So we all went back to bed. And, uh, but that was a great plan. That was ingenious, right? But sometimes, I, I've got to admit, um, I make pl plans and they turn out very bad. And I think we all make plans, and often they turn out bad. If you're, if you're following along in the bulletin, I'll have a few things up here on the slides, and you can fill that in, or you can just kind of listen today. Um, but I, I make plans, and they turn out bad. One of the worst plans I ever had was a few years ago, uh, we lived in Mitchell, and we decided to go down to Lincoln State Park, which is near Santa Claus, and camp. And when we camp, we tent camp. And we went down on Friday, and um, it poured, like torrential pouring, waters dripping inside of the tent, miserable sleep, lightning strikes so close at one point that our, our car alarm starts going off. So we wake up, and we, we had plans to go to Santa Claus. We had um, season tickets to Holiday World, and we were going to go to Holiday World that day, and I, we just canceled. Nope. We're miserable. We got like two hours of sleep. We're all cold and miserable. So we pack up and, and we packed up in, in my truck and Rachel's van. And I don't know if, if your family's like ours, but we like to race home if we are in different vehicles. I need to win. I need to get home first, right? So some of the guys are like, yep, I, I, I feel you. So we get to French Lick and um, there's a shortcut through French Lick, through the country roads, so you don't have to go through Paoli and Orleans. So Rachel goes straight. So Abigail and I decide we're going to take the shortcut. So we take the shortcut, and I'm like, this is going to be the easiest win of all time. And 
we come up and we come around a couple curves and we stop because the creek had gone over the road. I'm like, yeah, it rained a little last night, but how, how bad could it be? I mean, it's, you guys are like prophetic. You know what's going to happen. So I decide, yeah, let's do this. So we start driving and yeah, it's just barely up over the, you know, the, it's like two or three inches deep and I'm like, see, hun, this is no problem. And all of a sudden, whew, and water starts coming inside of the, the truck. So I gun it thinking I'm just going to make it through and I make it about 15 feet and glug, 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 glug. Abigail starts panicking, screaming, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're not going to die. We just let the water fill up into the truck about to the, the windows. I grab her and I open up the truck and I walk out of the creek, now a raging river apparently, and I start calling and there's no cell phone reception for Rachel, so I call a couple friends. We end up uh, being able to get it towed out. Um, it, it totaled the truck though. It was, it was totaled. Um, because water got inside the engine and um, we let it sit in the heat and it smelled like old, nasty, southern Indiana river water. So we just totaled it out. That was a bad plan, right? I, I, I have lots of bad plans. I asked Rachel the other night, I was like, hey, come up with a couple bad plans. And she said, I don't think I can. And then like 10 seconds later, she started rolling them off. <laughs> Last year for spring break, I had this ingenious plan that... Um, we were going to drive to Perdido Key in Florida. No problem, right? We'll, we'll just leave Friday after, church, or after school like everyone else. Except Crowder was in concert in Indianapolis that night. And I can't miss Crowder in Indianapolis. So we decide to, uh, I decide, to, that we can go up to the concert and leave after the concert and just drive down. I'll be fine, hun. I mean, we're leaving at midnight. It's only 12 hours. I'll be fine. I'll drink... 25 hour energies and we'll make it and we went to the concert and it was amazing as always and we drove and we drove and we get into somewhere Alabama somewhere way down there and I'm about ready to fall asleep they were sleeping so I wake Rachel up and I'm like hey I'm just going to pull into this rest area we're going to rest everything will be fine and she said no I'll just drive and we make it and Brant afterwards said I'm never driving to Florida again it was a bad plan. I thought, I can, I can do this, right? And if you're like me, you've, you've had bad plans, but sometimes our bad plans turn out really bad. You know, it's not just accidents or, or a little mess. They turn into these big messes. Sometimes our plans are selfish. Sometimes our plans can be deceitful. A lot of times our plans can hurt other people. I remember in second grade, uh, I had a girlfriend, which was very rare for me in grade school, and it was time for, it was Valentine's Day, and at our school, Lincoln Elementary, go Lincoln, um, they, uh, around Valentine's Day, they sold these things called candy grams. And they were a dollar, and you could fill out a little note to your, your, your crush, and then you got a little piece of candy. I thought, now's the time to make an impression on my girlfriend. So I went and stole $40 from my mom and bought her 40 candy grams. I was selfish there. I was pretty deceitful. I hurt my mom. Uh, she probably would have never found out, but the school knew that we were kind of a poor family. And when all of a sudden 40 candy grams showed up, they called mom and said, hey, did you give Troy 40 bucks? Nope. And I got a pretty good whooping. Uh, we, we call these kind of plans, this selfish, deceitful, hurting other people, one way to, to, to phrase that is sin. And we all do it, right? I mean, we all sin. Sometimes our sins can hurt other people. Sometimes they're, they're ways to, to, to make sure that we are safe. And, and a lot of times we deceive people so that they don't know about us. They don't know these sins. You know, high schoolers, and I know you're spread out today, high schoolers, you know that, that deceit when you tell mom and dad, hey, I'm going to go stay the night with a friend. Wink. Yeah, I used that one growing up. 
Or, or that time where you have that one hidden thing, you know, the hidden thing that if anyone found out, then, then they probably wouldn't love you like they do. We all have that. We, we have sin. Paul is, uh, he's the author of about half of our New, New Testament. Paul um, writes about sin a, a few times, and Paul writes to the early churches that were just formed and, and early Christians. And one of the times he's writing to the church at Rome, and he says that sin is when we don't do what we should or we do things we shouldn't. We, we come up with these plans to do things that we shouldn't do, or we come up with a plan to get out of things that we should. That's sin. And, and later on, it, he's, he's writing to a guy named Timothy, and he says, in fact, that's sin, and, and I'm the worst sinner of all. I'm the worst of all, and, and I think that a lot of times that's how I feel. I'm the worst. Like, if you guys knew my sins, we probably would struggle some. And if I knew yours, you would probably think the same thing. But Paul, in that same letter, when he writes it to the church at Rome, he says in Romans 3.23, it's going to be up here on the screen, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all do it. We all sin. I do it. You do. In fact, that's kind of the story of Scripture, I think, is that in the Old Testament, it, it tells about this relationship that God has with the people of Israel, and, and Israel sins, and they continue to sin. And then the New Testament, it's the story of God's plan of how he can fix that. It's the story of humanity. It's the story of you, and it's the story of me, that we sin. But the amazing thing I think about Christmas is, is, is it's really the beginning of God's plan to heal sin's brokenness. Christmas is the beginning of God's plan to heal sin's brokenness. And there's all kinds of brokenness when we sin, when we mess up, when we come up with these plans on our own. We have personal brokenness. We hurt ourselves. There's, there's death. Sin le leads to death, both physical and spiritual. And, and then there's this brokenness between us and God. And, and we feel it and we know it. And when we sin and we mess up, we, we tend to, to feel that even more. Romans 6.23, again, Paul's writing to the, this early church at Rome. He says, the wages of sin is death, but there's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, we all sin, but that's not the end. You see, God had a plan to fix all that. He fixes that brokenness. That's why Christmas is here. That's why Christ came, to be born to fix our mess up. And hundreds of years before Jesus came, there was a, a guy who was a prophet, and a prophet just means that he could, he could tell the future. He knew what was going to happen in the future because God spoke into him. And his name was Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah talks to Israel, and he, he says, here's what's going to happen. Here's God's plan to fix your mistakes and then the mistakes of the world. And, and this is a pretty popular scripture around this time of year because it tells what's going to happen hundreds of years after Isaiah is alive that this guy's going to come and, and he's going to fix things, fix our sin. Here's what Isaiah 53 says. I'm going to start with uh, verse 4. Surely he, and this is all about Jesus, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak on of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. I love verse 10, and I really didn't notice it until this week as I was studying. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. See, it was God's will, it was God's plan to fix us, to fix our sin problem by sending Jesus to die for us. And, and that's really a, a word that we use in the church called salvation. It means that we are saved through Jesus. That we have a problem and it's called sin. We all have it. And God fixes that. God's plan to fix that is is saving us through Jesus. And that's salvation. God's plan to fix us. We're saved from our sins because 2,000 years ago, a baby was miraculously born. And he lived and grew up and lived a perfect life and he died for us. I, I love verse 3, which is right before the section that I just read. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he was esteemed not. See, it was man's plan to despise him. And a lot of times we, men, women, humanity, we despise Jesus. We, we do things on our own and, and we sin. But God's plan was to fix all that. So, it wouldn't be Christmas without reading a little bit of the Christmas story, right? So Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. And there should be a, maybe there's a verse on, or a page number on there. It doesn't look like it is. So anyone, we're going to, uh, whenever I was a youth minister, we used to play a game called the sword drill. So if you have it in your, in one Bible's near you, tell me the page number. 956. So if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible around near you. Um, grab that. Use the one on your phone, whatever you need to do. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 2. So this is the fulfillment of what Isaiah said. So Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, said, hey, there's just going to be this guy. He's going to be born, and he's going to die for you. So hundreds of years later, Jesus is born, and we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. And out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find out from... Uh, As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they start saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night. And he left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. 
Verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Two things I want us to look at in this, and they're going to be super short. First, man wanted Jesus killed. And Isaiah said that was going to happen, right? He said that that man's going to despise him, and and a, a man wanted to kill him, Herod. It was Herod's plan to kill Jesus so that Herod could stay in power. Man wanted Jesus killed. And the second thing is, God worked to make sure Jesus was safe so that one day he could save the world. God's plan was, hey, Joseph, get your family out of here. You need to be safe so that one day Jesus can save. He he sends magi to bring gifts. And I think that's important because I think those magi bring these gifts to help ensure that Joseph, who was poor by any stretch of the imagination, could afford to leave for Egypt. The Magi bring these gifts, and then the angel warns the family, so the family flees to Egypt. Jesus is safe so that later he can save. And that's all part of God's plan. You see, our plans fail. My plans fail. I I, I hope I'm not the only one with goofy fail stories in plans. I know I'm not the only one whose plans are sin, because we all do that. But God's plan prevails. God's plan to save us prevails. And it it, it prevails through Jesus. And it prevails through those of us who follow Jesus. This morning, if you follow Jesus, God's plan is to use you to share his message. That, hey, I know you sin, I do too. But God's good because he saved us. God has saved us. God wants this relationship and every person who sins from the beginning of time, from Adam in Genesis until now, sin. And God came up with a plan that just like sin entered the world through one guy, Adam, then salvation, being saved, comes through one person. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And that's what Christmas is about. Christmas is about us having a baby being born to save us so that he can die for us. And this morning I know that there's got to be someone here who, who's never really accepted this gift that Paul said. That, that yes, there's wages for sin. You earn something when we sin. But there's a gift And that gift is being saved through Jesus. And this morning, if if that's you, we're going to sing a couple songs and we're going to invite you to come and say, I want to accept that gift. I opened presents this morning, but those presents pale in comparison to being saved through Jesus. Or maybe this morning you need to say, I've been saved, but I haven't been living out God's plan in my life. I haven't been telling other people. I haven't been living a way that, that points people to their Savior. So this morning we're going to sing a couple songs, and we're just going to invite you to come, and Kevin's going to be up front, and maybe a couple elders, and if you want to come and talk to them and share, hey, I know I've messed up. You don't have to get into the nitty-gritty details. God knows all that. But if you need to come and do that, or if you want to come and use the stairs and just pray, we're going to invite you to do that as we sing a few of these songs. So if you would, pray with me uh, as we enter into this time for you to come forward. God, thank you. Thank you that, that you came up with a plan. And God, your plan is perfect. You saved us through Jesus. And God, we ask that this morning, if, if anyone needs to, to accept you, to accept this gift that you would speak into them, God, that these words that I've spoken would not be my words, God, they would be yours. So, Father, we'd ask that, um, that you move as we sing these songs, that this would be a chance for us to, to move closer to you, to accept this gift of Jesus. Father, thank you for Christmas. Thank you that we can celebrate 
your perfect plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for taking time out of your day to watch this week's message. I hope that it challenged you to take your next steps towards God. If you saw anything in the message that you need to speak with someone about or you would just like to connect with someone on staff, we'd be glad to talk with you. Please feel free to contact me at the email address or phone number below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.